Welcome to the Business of Biotech, brought to you by Bioprocess Online and graciously sponsored by Cytiva, formerly GE Healthcare Life Sciences. On our last episode, Alan Shaw and I gave you an overview of the series to come, sprinkled with nuggets of wisdom from a guy who's led a lot of startup biopharmas to clinical success. Today, I've invited another luminary who comes healed with decades of experience leading companies to successful destinies, whether that destiny is an IPO, a merger, an acquisition, or steady growth as a private entity. Should your new bio company stay private, build toward an IPO, seek a merger? Why is this an incredibly important consideration from the inception? Let's talk about it with industry luminary, Dr. Francois Nader. I'm pretty excited about this conversation because I believe that we've selected a guest who um, can really bring a lot of value to the table on this discussion today. We're going to spend some time talking about why it's so important for an emerging uh, biopharma leader to begin uh, with with the end in mind, to begin their their business, their company with the end in mind, the goal in mind from a financial perspective, uh, and keep that in mind as they kind of carry their their company through the continuum of of, uh, its life stages. So uh, I wanted to invite a guest who would bring to the table um, a lot of history and experience uh, doing just that, uh, taking companies public, uh, strategically keeping them private perhaps for a time, um, working through mergers and acquisitions. And uh, through, uh, through my colleague Rob Wright, a life science leader, uh, we determined that, that Francois Nader would be uh, an excellent pick for this conversation. Uh, so we asked him if he would join us, uh, and he graciously accepted our invitation. Francois, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Pleasure to be here today. Yeah, so I just want to real quickly uh, spare you the embarrassment of, of bragging yourself up. I'm going to do it for you uh, and give our audience a little bit of background on why you're such a good pick for this conversation. So Francois uh, currently is a, a, a member of the board of several uh, boards of several pharmaceutical companies, um, uh, Noteworthy Moderna, which, uh, am I saying that correctly, Moderna? Correct, yeah. Yep which raised uh, $600 million, I believe, uh, the day of its 2018 IPO uh, and entered the market that year with a $7.5 billion valuation. Uh, Francois is on the board at Prevail Therapeutics, which is a gene therapy firm that IPO'd uh, recently in uh, 2019. Uh, He serves on the board of Tolaris Therapeutics, which is privately held, correct? That's correct. Yep, privately held uh, cell therapy company. uh, still on the board or, or recently served on the, the board of Alexion Pharmaceuticals? Uh, st- still on the board of Alexion. Okay, so Alexion is a, a more mature uh, and public company that focuses on uh, monoclonal antibodies, and I believe they're at like $3.5 billion in revenue. Um, Acceleron Pharma, current? Or- off, correct. Yep, okay, which uh, went public in 2013. Uh, and I believe this is... A, Previous board experience includes Clementia, uh, which was acquired last last year by Ipsen. Correct. Yep. Uh, Advanced Accelerate app applications, which went public in 2015. Uh, Baxalta, which was acquired by Shire in 2016 for $32 billion. Um, and lest you assume that Francois is uh, limited to, you know, the, the, the typical stereotypical uh, board guy and you don't chalk him up as a, as a biopharma leader, uh, Francois is the guy who spent nine years in the C-suite at NPS Pharma, seven of those years as president and CEO, uh, and he's the guy who orchestrated the company's turnaround from its origins as a uh, the, and this is legitimate, a uh, 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 spider venom <laughs> company. That's correct. Yep, to, uh, to uh, a company that focused, focused on orphan drugs, uh, and his leadership there culminated with the $5.2 billion sale to Shire back in 2015. So he's got the board chops and the executive leadership chops. That's absolutely true. Got it all right? 
got it all right. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So, Francois, you've you've steered uh, emerging pharma to big pharma and, and everything in between. I, I want you today to distill your experience down as much as possible to speak very specifically to new and emerging uh, biopharma leaders, the leaders of new and emerging biopharmas. So. Um, at a high level, why, why do you think it's important for uh, leaders at emerging biopharmas to do, do as I said, kind of keep, uh, begin their, their business with the end in mind? Because we are in the business of creating value. Uh, that's uh, what our, our business is all about, and we create value to very specific stakeholders. We create value to our patients, uh, we create value to our investors, uh, to our employees, and we create value to society in general. So once you keep this in mind, frankly, everything in any company, emerging or others, has to be focused on creating the value. And how do we create value in our business? A couple of ways of doing it, not the least being uh, innovation and uh, putting uh, eventually putting on the market uh, products that uh, treat or cure diseases and uh, reduce healthcare costs. In doing so, uh, there is, it's a long journey, it's a very hazardous journey, it's a risky journey, but at the same time it's a very rewarding journey. So when you embark on this journey, uh, any leader has to keep the end in mind, and the end is how do I create the value? And this is the right, if you will, mindset, in my opinion at least, mm -hmm. uh, versus uh, another mindset, which is how can I exit and how can I exit successfully? So uh, my, my, uh, my theory is successful companies are built on uh, value creation. They're certainly not built on exit strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how, in, in your mind, how difficult is that for the leader of a, a company that's probably, uh, probably a scientist uh, by, uh, by training, uh, probably very excited about um, the, the science, if you will, I mean, the, the, the therapy. How difficult is it for folks who kind of fit that persona to embrace uh, the, the business side, the company valuation, uh, building value for your stakeholders element of, of the game? Uh, it is challenging because, frankly, uh, a scientist uh, did not get there by accident. It's, uh, it, takes, it takes into consideration personality. It takes into consideration life objectives. It takes into consideration a lot long years of studying and, uh, and science. So it's a given mindset. And uh, when, uh, when scientists decide to jump uh, the fence and become entrepreneur, some of them come to it naturally, and therefore some of them have this uh, business, if you will, phenotype ingrained in them, and they get it very quickly. Others, frankly, and there is not, nothing right or wrong, others prefer to remain in the, in the realm of science, and therefore they have to associate themselves with an uh, individual with a business acumen or a business experience. Mm -hmm. So no one can do it on their own anyways. Uh, but um, it is important for scientists either to be inclined to do it or to learn it or to associate themselves actually with people who can help them uh, build this, this value, if you will. Yeah. Uh so again, speaking to that persona, that new and emerging biopharma leader, what uh, forces are they perhaps unaware of that are going to come to bear on their decision about where to take their company, whether to keep it private, whether to go public, whether to shop it out for, for M&A? Um, what, what are some of the kind of outside drivers like demands and capital and investment community factors that they're perhaps not thinking about? Yeah, all of the above, actually. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because every scientist, and that is what makes scientists so unique and so powerful in their mission, every scientist, rightfully so, think that their product is it. In other words, the FDA cannot wait to approve it. The investors cannot wait to invest. I mean, they, they are so much into what they have spent years and years developing, and they generally believe in it, which is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. However, reality actually hits. Um, there is something called capital. Uh, that's kind of the fuel in the tank. And without, you can have the most beautiful car ever, 
it, if it doesn't have fuel, it usually doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. You have competition. You know, we are in, in our field, there is always competition, and I've seen it over and over and over again. Uh, scientists and leaders in general kind of discount uh, the power of competition, but it's truly there, and it has to be accounted for. There is the aspect of something called execution, building a company, hiring the right folks, and frankly moving from uh, science to preclinical to clinical to pre-marketing, to marketing. This whole process is a long journey, and uh, there is nothing intuitive about it. It has to be done a certain way. Last but not least, you have the regulators that, uh, in general, scientists don't have necessarily an appreciation for, but they are the necessary evil, and uh, regulators become extremely important players in this journey. And mm -hmm. last but certainly not least, uh, investors and they come in different shapes and forms. They have different strategic objectives. They have their own internal uh, focus, their own internal priorities. And guess what? Because they put the capital on the table, they, have, they are part of the decision making. Scientists in general tend to be individual, again, without generalizing, who make their own decision because that's what science is all about. Yet when you are building a company, you have not only to continue making your own decisions, but take into consideration and listen very carefully to the advice and suggestion and at times dictates of others, which is here again, easier said than done at times. Sure. Uh, that, that continuum that you talk about, that long road, that long journey, surely the, uh, the, the investment, um, I guess, an, an environment within the context of the company itself, uh, the investment motive, uh, the investment drivers change, right, as the company matures and moves along that continuum. Can you, can you just give us some color on that? Like, uh, what, what can an emerging biopharma leader expect as the company moves through uh, development and, and clinical and perhaps even on to, you know, pre-regulatory stages? What can they expect from a, a reaction or uh, within the context of the investment community? Well, through this journey, the only common denominator is the need for capital. Yeah, that, that's yeah. the common, it doesn't go away. Right, yeah. <laughs> It's increasing, actually. What changes, though, is where is the capital coming from? Okay. So mm -hmm. in the early days, for a scientist, it could be, it could be grants. It could be non-dilutive uh, investment. It could be friends and family. It could be... Uh, seed investors, it could be multiple different forms. But uh, here again, I mean, once the VCs get into the game, um, then it becomes a little bit more structured. And not all VCs are created equal in the sense that based on their mission and their strategic, every firm has a niche. Some of them are big enough to have multiple niches. But I think the practical challenge of, uh, of a scientist is to determine who to work with and which doors on which to knock. And um, there is an important component to this, which is the fit. And it might sound trivial, but it's not, because see, this investor-scientist relationship is a bit like a marriage, mm -hmm. very easy to get in, extremely difficult to get out of it. And what I mean by that is the fact that there should be a, a common understanding of the strategy between the leader and the investors. Otherwise, it yields to a lot of issues. So very early in the process determining, and so for example, some VCs do invest in very early stages and want to get out as soon as an IND is filed or a phase one is, is successfully conducted. Others go all the gamut to approval. Others go all the gamut to marketed product. So. Uh, putting together this profile of the company, the profile of the leader, and the profile of the investor, something that is easier said than done, but should be done very early in the process. And those investors will change over time, obviously. Right. Yeah. Um, what, what are some of the other, can you, can you address any other risks uh, of, of engaging in this, uh, this relationship that you liken to a marriage, for instance, uh, you know, if there, if there is a full alignment to your point and maybe the uh, IPO becomes a financing event, uh, an exit opportunity for the investors or, 
Um, the investors are eager to exit the company before it finds success. I mean, other, other kind of potential risks or pitfalls? Well, the, the, the pitfall is when there is not an alignment on strategy. And one of the ways to actually make sure that all the different stakeholders are singing the same tune is the importance of the board. Okay. Because mm -hmm. the board is really the forum where you have the investors, you have leadership, and more often than not, you have independents like myself who sit on the board either as a board member or the chairman. So the board ends up being a very good forum for discussing the strategy, discussing the, uh, the clinical development plan, discussing the risks, discussing the uh, regulatory pathway, discussing in general the strategy of the company and make sure that there is an alignment. Once the board, including management, including, is aligned, then the leadership can execute and focus really on making it happen. The Business of Biotech podcast is dedicated to helping new and emerging biopharma leaders navigate the organizational, financial, and regulatory aspects of the biotherapeutics market landscape. So is Cytiva, the company formerly known as GE Healthcare Life Sciences, and the gracious underwriters of this project. Find out how Cytiva is helping life science researchers and biopharmaceutical manufacturers evolve how new therapies and precision medicines are discovered, made, and used at www.cytiva.com. That's www.cytiva.com. You and I had a conversation uh, not too long ago, Francois, about uh, the uh, I, what I what I would characterize as the high unlikelihood of uh, a new or emerging, like a, a first generation new or emerging biopharma leader taking their company to IPO. Like a lot usually happens in between mergers, acquisitions. Like there's a there's a lot that typically happens, it's, although it's not unheard of. Um, I want to I want to have I want to kind of shift the, the conversation to IPO and M and A. And, and talk about what should be in place organizationally for, for each approach, each, each strategy. Like if you're looking for a buyer, you know, what are the key components to have in place? If you're looking to, you know, take the company public, what are the key, key organizational things that you should have in place? Sure. So we, we have really, I mean, it boils down to really four options at the macro level, 30,000 mm -hmm. foot view. You have really four options for any company at the stage you're describing. Option one is to go at it alone, okay? With this, high risk, high reward. It requires a lot of capital, uh, but eventually the company will remain independent uh, privately, they would say. It's an option. The second option is a partnership. In other words, we have three products in the pipeline, we'll partner one, and therefore we have an infusion of capital that will enable us to uh, fund the, two, the development of the two other products. Uh, third option is an M&A. And with this, it's pretty binary. A, a big strategic or another company would show up, uh, put uh, the, a, an interesting offer on the table, and that's the end of the game. The company is sold uh, to or is acquired by uh, Big Pharma or another company, and that's the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. And then you have the IPO. The IPO is probably the most challenging, but could be the most rewarding. And uh, IPO, as we all know, means that we're shifting from being a public company, a private company to being a public company. And with that, frankly, comes a, a, a number of interesting things. What do uh, IPO investors, what do public company investors look for? And what they look for, frankly, is something called, again, value creation, sustainable value creation. That's what they look for. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the company has to structure itself to be creating value in a sustainable way. Now, going public starts with the basic, uh, IPO 101, is to structure the company from a financial perspective and from a governance perspective to be eligible to go public and make sure that the company doesn't trip on uh, on regulatory issues related to SECs and uh, and other uh, regulatory organization. And this is easier said than done because uh, we need to make sure that we have the systems, the processes, the people who can make it happen. Yeah. Right? 
Second, it has to do with uh, convincing uh, investors of the value of the portfolio. And this means that the CEO and his, their leadership team, they have to go out and sell the concept of the company. Some, some leaders find it easy to do. Others find it exceedingly difficult to do. And this is where the adjustment needs to take place because, frankly, if the leader, the CEO, doesn't feel comfortable doing it, he or she should have around them uh, individuals who have the experience of doing that. And last but certainly not least, once the IPO is executed, you need to continue doing two things. One, developing uh, the pipeline and continue focusing on strategy and execution. But also the other aspect is to manage our new stakeholders and make sure that there is, is this, uh, this interaction, ongoing interaction between the leadership and the new investors. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure that they understand the story. Make sure that they're not surprised. Make sure that, uh, you know, they are aware of the pluses but also the changes of the company and work with them hand in hand. In my experience, when I, when I was in, in these situations having to really manage what we call the street, uh, it, it takes time. Uh, I used to spend probably 25% of my time uh, in, in meetings with investors. But from my perspective, this is time well spent because the more your investors know you, know about you, trust you, believe that you can lead, okay. believe that you can manage challenges, uh, the better off the company is. Yeah. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with a tough one, Francois. Okay. Go for it. And, and if, you don't Go for it. if you don't want to answer it, I'll, I'll totally I'll take, forgive you. I'll take the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have the choice between a, a rock star so as it relates to investors, right? Company valuation, trying to, to pitch the company. You have a choice between a rock star uh, staff or a potential, you know, breakthrough, a breakthrough potential blockbuster therapy. Uh, you have one story to tell or the other, like really, really great people or a really, really potentially great, great therapy. What, what, what are the investment? investment community want to hear more? Uh, investor community wants to hear about people because people make people make good products, breakthrough mm -hmm. products, breakthrough products don't make good people. Yeah. And good. you have the best, you have the best product in the world in the hands of people who don't know how to manage it will become a failure. Uh, with no exception, every investor I talk to believe in people first. Obviously, the <laughs> Uh, innovative product, the breakthrough you talked about, come very, very close second. Sure. Yeah. But uh, uh, again, the challenge uh, is often you. It's easy to find. It's easier. Let me put it this way. It's easier to find a good product. It is usually more challenging to build a an A plus team. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you, you talked uh, quite a bit about uh, the potential benefits of, of an IPO, uh, some M&A strategy. Uh, when, when, in your opinion, does it make sense to, when and why, in your opinion, does it make sense to stay, to stay private? If you take the case of uh, Moderna, <laughs> it's, a, it's a public, very interesting public case where they decided to stay public for a very long time because... Stay, the, stay private. They, they, I'm sorry, stay yep. private. Let yep. me stay private for a long time because they have an investor who had deep pockets and believed in them, and therefore they did not need to go to the market uh, to raise capital. And when finally Moderna went public, it went public with a big splash at a very, very high valuation. Um, I think uh, some companies actually, uh, and this is ba basically it, if you're lucky enough to have investors that have deep pockets who believe in the company and are willing to fund it long, long term, uh, staying public is much easier because, frankly, you don't have to worry about the streets. You have to worry about a very limited number of investors. You don't have to worry about uh, the whole governance issue, the whole structure, processes, controls. You don't have to worry about the stuff as much. You have to obviously keep your books in order, but it's not a priority and you can focus more on 
actually doing. You don't have to, to report every every quarter to the, um, you don't have an earnings call. It's easier. At times, unfortunately, I mean, you get to a limit of what, uh, what investors can do with you, and therefore, the IPO at the right time is a very interesting strategy because you open uh, your company to additional investors and you open the company for value creation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> put yourself in the, in, the, in the shoes of an emerging uh, biopharma leader uh, who is making some decisions uh, around these topics. Um, who do you turn to? for advice beyond, beyond your board? Like how important is it to have uh, uh, a mentor, an advisor, someone who's been there and done that? And who, who should you turn to for that kind of input? So uh, that's a very interesting question because, I mean, we said that over and over and over and over again, uh, being a CEO is a very lonely job. Yeah. It's one of the loneliest jobs I've ever experienced in my life. Um, and therefore, um, as a CEO, it is always, at least in my book, advisable to have a, a small group of trusted and trustworthy mentors or advisors to whom you can turn, who are not biased, if you will, by self-interest in the company. Uh, people who can give you advice uh, for you as a leader, not necessarily with the company or with the without any uh, specific, if you will, um, intent behind that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find it personally to be very gratifying to have individuals who I trust and like and who are a phone call away and say, what do you think? Uh, because frankly, everyone, um, uh, everyone has their own bias. Uh, the other component is frankly turned to the independent members on the board uh, because they are by definition independent. They're not investors. Obviously, they have... Uh, the, uh, the the company in mind and the the creation of value in mind, sure. but they have, they don't have necessarily the same uh, bias as uh, either leadership or investors. Um, and then you can turn to uh, what we call advisors with a capital A, which is your legal team, uh, outside legal team, and your bankers with whom. Uh, you interact. But here again, I mean, there is an intrinsic bias, if you will, um, to, to that, that uh, at time. I mean, there are terrific, uh, terrific outside counsels and at outside legal advisors. There mm -hmm. are terrific bankers, if you will, who, who advise you in a very neutral, uh, neutral way uh, and advise you. And frankly, I, I was fortunate enough to have a couple of bankers who really advise me independent from the benefit to their firm uh, or their personal benefit. But uh, at the end of the day, it is a, a very personal decision that has to be taken uh, in synergy with the board, in synergy with the chairman. And by, I mean, just to, 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 to take attention for a second, there is nothing in my book that replaces the absolutely critically important relationship between CEO and chairman. Mm -hmm. Among all the relationships in the company, I believe that this relationship, CEO-chairman, is by far uh, the most important. Interesting. And that should be a relation of trust, a relation of respect, a relationship of partnership. Because as a CEO, ultimately you have to turn to your chair and say, Let's talk about it and feel comfortable. Pick up the phone and call your chair in good days and in crappy days. I was very, very lucky to have such a chair, Peter Tombros, who was a friend, who is and was for me a fantastic friend and mentor and and figurehead, if you will. And frankly, I picked up the phone and called him in good days and really, really not so good days. Yeah. This relationship, in my experience, I'm the chairman of three companies. And each one of them has a first-time CEO. And this is the kind of relationship I, uh, I, I tend to build with my CEO, a relationship where we can talk about anything and everything in an open and transparent way. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very cool. I didn't realize that three of your companies are, uh, have first-time CEOs. It makes me wonder, uh, you, you mentioned that being a CEO is the loneliest job in the world. I can believe that. Um, 
but now working with these first time CEOs, do, do, you, do you pine for it at all? Do you, do you miss, miss any aspects of those days? I don't miss the, the days of CEO. My contribution nowadays is different. I prefer to contribute through others rather, rather than being behind the steering wheel myself. But yeah. um, again, I'm, uh, I'm chairman of three companies on the board of uh, two others and uh, very involved also with young entrepreneurs with uh, my work with NYU, for example, in their accelerated program. So I really personally enjoy this mentorship because I know what it takes because mm -hmm. I was in their shoes not too long ago. Yeah. So it's still very fresh in my mind. I, I know exactly what they're going through. And, and I, think I, I think I failed to mention that, that you were, uh, you, you're, you're teaching at NYU on, the, on this exact topic. Is that, is that right? Correct, correct. I'm giving a couple of uh, lectures at NYU on, actually, I'm, uh, I'm involved with the School of Medicine there, where uh, they developed a program for scientists and physicians who want to become entrepreneurs and they set up a program where people like me and others actually contribute to the knowledge, building the knowledge of these scientists and physicians. Mm -hmm. Also in, involved with Stern where we have a, call it an accelerator program where we also mentor um, young, uh, young talents, young CEOs who, are, who have their dreams and their product and their ambition and uh, try to help them uh, be successful. Yeah, well, that's exciting and, and surely gratifying work. Uh, if you could uh, give us uh, maybe a, 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 an eighth of a free credit from your class at NYU with some parting advice, <laughs> your, uh, your, your concluder, um, taking, taking in you know, your, your experience uh, on these issues as a, as a CEO, as a, a, a chairman, a board member, a professor, um, just leave us with some parting wisdom for the leaders of emerging biopharma companies who are making decisions around where to, where to kind of steer the ship. Me included, I think uh, accepting to be the leader of any emerging biotech company, you have to be somehow crazy. I mean, <laughs> I think because there is no way to describe in different, uh, different terms what a, a leader CEO in our business has to go through. And, uh, uh, you have really to, <laughs> something is not really right to, to accept doing that. Mm. But, but, but I would never replace it with anything else. It's the most gratifying role that I've ever had in my life. Uh, it's, 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 it's an amazingly rewarding role. But again, I mean, not everything is always uh, easy. Not everything is, it is happy. Not everything. But there is, there is this amazing, um, a vision that one day, someday, uh, my innovation, the product I'm working on, could really treat or cure uh, diseases for patients who are waiting. Yeah. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that replaces this fulfilling uh, emotion, if you will. It's really very much emotional that would lead to that. Uh, the journey is tough and rough. Um, uh, don't, don't lose hope. Uh, my company, in my seven years as CEO, we had six, one, two, three, four, five, six near-death experiences. Mm. And when I say near-death, it meant that I was about to shut off the light. And we re-emerge and the rest is history. So keep faith, but also uh, listen very carefully to others because we are so ingrained and so much in what we do that at times our listening is not there. Uh, pick up good advisors, people who have been there, done that, who can, uh, who can uh, show you the road um, and, uh, and avoid you stepping on the landmines because they've stepped on them before you. Uh, and uh, just not only listen, but, but listen and put into action. I've seen, fortunately, too many CEOs that they would listen and it goes in one ear and goes out from the other ear because they think they know it all. Right. And, and be humble enough to know that you don't know it all, despite me. We're dealing with very smart people. Usually they're genius, but they don't know it all and have the humility of listening to others and, um, and really putting their experience to work for you. And, um, again, cash is, cash is king, and uh, we're here to build value for your stakeholders, all of them, not one of them. I mean, patient is always first, but mm -hmm. the others are, are there as well, waiting. 
So um, that would be probably what I could uh, at least advise them to do. Oh, that's very good advice. And I, I very much appreciate the conversation, Fra Francois. It's been a, a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you for joining us. Same here, Matt. Always a pleasure. Yeah, I'd like to do it again soon. Thanks. Anytime. <laughs>that's Dr. Francois Nader. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech, produced by Bioprocess Online and graciously sponsored by Cytiva, formerly GE Healthcare Life Sciences. If you like what you heard here today, please subscribe, give us five stars, and be sure to subscribe to the Bioprocess Online newsletter at bioprocessonline.com. Tune in next time for an in-depth conversation on building your pitch, your pitch deck, the pitching process, and the nuance and human elements of the pitch that will give you a fundraising edge. In the meantime, thanks for listening.